No, we've really had a wide-ranging discussion, uh, especially on the strategy. I just wonder whether we could sort of uh, come together in a sort of summary of your lines of effort on the strategy. Yeah, yeah thanks, Jeff. I, I was always trying to come back to that, so I appreciate that question. Um, our first line of effort is, um, as I've spoken about it quite at, quite at length throughout the uh, throughout the discussion, is about um, developing our contribution into the joint force. I think that we've we've talked through in a lot of detail on that. Um, it's it's really important in there. The only thing I'd add in addition um, is that we uh, we are doing work under that line of effort uh, to better understand our preparedness requirements. That that's work through the strategic centre as well. And that way we can put a better understanding around force generation. You know, what do we need to generate in order to deliver those effects uh, into the joint force? Our uh, second line of effort, as I've talked to quite a, in quite a, uh, a reasonable amount of detail as well, is continuing to develop our intelligent and skilled workforce. Um, and that, that is a, a huge body of work and it requires constant attention. And indeed, I do emphasise there um, aspects of innovation that will become important to us as well. Um, I think I mean, one thing I'd add too is, is ensuring that we post for effect, not just to fill holes. So, um, you know, and that includes people into the joint staff roles. And if it doesn't hurt us to send someone to a joint position, then we've probably sent the wrong person. You know, that old, that old discussion point. Um, our third line of effort uh, really is an important one, and that's um, about um, deepening our relationships and strengthening engagement. Um, and I talk a lot about. Uh, across all of all of the Air Force team um, about our communications and engagement strategy. And I think you've said this to me when you were the Chief of Air Force, you know, it's, it's, you, you just can't send the message and assume that it's out there and understood. You know, it's what you send compared to what's heard, what's interpreted, there's so many factors in, in understanding. So engagement becomes a very important part of getting that feedback and the feedback loop to understand, you know, what's our value and how are we seen, but also how do we want to be seen? Uh, so engage, and strengthening those engagements and, 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 and making our relationships deeper are really important. Most importantly, I think um, uh, it's you know, not just about in Air Force, although that's important. It's with our joint colleagues and in the defence enterprise. Um, it's very important about industry, and we have spoken about industry as well in this, in this, in this discussion. Uh, but, but significantly, it's about our international partners. Um, our allies uh, in the US and, and New Zealand, of course, but then really key international partners um, in the region and even even a, a slightly further afield, in, in, particularly in the Southeast Asia. Uh, and there's no mistaking the government's focus on this with the Pacific step up. So we're working very strongly at the moment to build and strengthen relationships that have always been there for you know 30 plus years with countries like um, Papua New Guinea, um, re-establishing relationships with Fiji, um, our ability to support through humanitarian assistance and disaster relief just recently with the cyclones into Fiji. Uh, these are all parts of building confidence and trust and understanding um, uh, for both us and, and our partner nations. Uh, so we understand what they need and we can meet their needs as opposed to going in and telling them what we think they should have. Uh, it's about listening, it's about understanding, about engaging. Uh, so that becomes really important. One of the key um, capabilities from, once again, a, an example of air power um, delivery, if you like, delivering air power effects into the joint force, um, is we're working at the moment as part of the Pacific step up on uh, the uh, Pacific, what we're calling the Pacific air community. And that's to enhance capabilities in our Pacific island, uh, the Pacific island countries that are our regional partners, uh, so that they can task us for when they need assistance. Um, so for humanitarian assistance or even logistic support uh, so that we can be there to provide for their um, security. And indeed, if we can do that, once again, set the conditions where their pro prosperity increases. And now you get that really, really important balance there um, that starts to then uh, allow, the, allow the region to stand up. Um, and that's really what's, what's really important to us. So as a key example, that's one of the lines of effort about what are we as an Air Force? How do we deliver air power? through strengthening, strengthening our engagement and deepening the relationships that we have there as well. Um, the fourth line of effort for us is about um, evolving our culture. Um, that's been an ongoing pursuit and it's something that, that won't change. It will be aligned with the work uh, that I think I mentioned earlier, that the Chief of Defence is leading on, on work for the ADF, uh, Defence ADF missions, 
um, uh, also leading on ADF values. So we've got um, Navy, Ar Army, Air Force and Defence values. They're all sort of slightly different. Um, we've had some discussions now about why can't they all be aligned? Uh, and, and I think you know, I support that. Um, we're talking about key values of courage, respect, integrity. They're things that really resonate with all of us. So building those across the ADF, what's the, and how do we evolve that culture um, in Air Force through that line of effort to be aligned with the, um, with the ADF values that are coming forward. But to me, it's not just about that. Um, it's still about recognising Air Force's identity. So delivering air power, Air Force delivering air power effects into the Joint Force is, is still about Air Force. It's about our virtues, our traits, um, our aptitude. Uh, it's about those things that we bring to the Joint Force. In some ways, it's the same as diversity. We all, all talk very clearly about diversity across all of the areas, and you know, we want gender diversity, and um, you know, we work very hard on Indigenous participation, really important to get that diverse nature in our workforce. I apply the same logic in the Joint Force. We need diversity to get the strengths, the best of everything. Um, so evolving our culture also uh, includes those sort of aspects. It's actually a good point. I've never thought of it like that. But, you know, I always thought that Joint was built on a foundation of the three three services uh, yeah. to a large large yeah. extent. So yeah. I think that's a that's a very valid point because the cultures actually bring different thinking mm. to the problem space mm. and and that diversity gives you the best solution. Yeah, I think so. And I, I um, when I first came in as the chief, I think some people as I was trying to work out and and uh, and explain my view, um, there was the words repeated back to me. You know, our journey to to purple. I said, no, it's not actually a journey to purple. Hmm. It's a journey to joint. But that doesn't mean that we're all the same. So we still bring Air Force attributes to deliver air power into the joint force. So I think your point there, that's uh, really strongly uh, of the view. And that those aspects will come out in our line of effort around evolving our culture. Uh, and the final line of effort, um, which is really important to me, uh, is um, ensuring we have um, agile um, and coherent governance. So uh, trying to just put a bit more discipline around um, understanding what the Air Force operating model is. And from that, uh, starting to get um, a balance of what are the outputs that Air Force needs to deliver in order to provide that air power effect into the joint force. And if we can understand what those outputs are, then put in means by which we can measure them with a, with a more coherent governance structure around that, then I can understand how we're performing uh, get a better handle on risk um, and understand what I can do to treat risk. Um, also see where there's gaps or where there's opportunities. So even more importantly, the opportunity, the, 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 the action to take um, and value um, opportunity when it's presented and, and to grab a hold of it. Uh, so by, by delivering on those and moving those forward, um, that gives me a better way of, once again, providing that advice to the CDF and to government. It allows me to better prioritise within all the the capabilities that we have and, and the constrained resources that we'll have and, and may well have into the future. I think that's always going to be a nature of our business. So that, that agile and coherent government governance is really vital to pulling that together. When I look at all of those across our lines of effort, when I can, if we can start to deliver on those, then I, then I get a, a group in Air Force. I get Air Force people, the, the, the heart of Air Force, that better understand what it is we're trying to do. They better understand our mission. They understand their part in it. They can relate that to the importance of the, every, the work they do every day and do that stuff that's important and not do the stuff that doesn't matter. Uh, so by building all that forward, then um, you know, I think that's the way I have an opportunity now with the Air Force I've been given to actually build and bring Air Force forward more strongly in the future. Sounds like a great body of work. I do notice you've got a new strategy and I, I was like to just explore some of the reasons behind that and, yeah. and what it'll look like. Yeah, um, new strategy. Um, to me, this is an evolving strategy. Uh, there's no great surprises in, in the content of it, uh, but what it's about is, is starting to examine where we sit at the moment within the strategic environment, and there's things that have changed. Uh, so since the government's white paper 2016, uh, since that was issued, uh, you know, I think the white paper settings were pretty accurate. Uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were a good assessment as to where we were sitting in the strategic environment. Uh, but things have come along a lot quicker than we expected. 
very much the way we the, the sort of things we expected, but far quicker than than, than what was thought in that in that paper. Uh, so we need to be prepared to respond to those. So you know, how does Air Force do that now? We've got um, a strategic environment where there's this increasing focus on the common term now of grey zone. Yeah, you know, it's mm-hmm. about competition. Uh, we we have to be realistic about it. How can Air Force position, posture, and present itself to be able to to operate in that sort of an environment? And how do we deliver air power effects best for government to to ensure that we can provide for Australia's national um, interest, and that is security and prosperity, certainly, and including in our region. So um, that's really what the the Air Force strategy, the emerging Air Force strategy is getting to, is how do we do that as a continuously operating Air Force all day, every day, day after day, uh, across the full spectrum of our capabilities, and how do we meet that across the spectrum of conflict that we now see? And that obviously ranges from collaboration through to cooperation, certainly competition, and we're seeing that right at the moment in this COVID-19 world um, and uh, some of the international uh, implications that are emerging. And of course, aiming to be able to best bring air power effects as a part of a joint force now to meet whole of government requirements so that we can avoid needing to go into a conflict environment and that's uh, that's uh, you know how does air power best suit that and that's where we're starting to get to with the uh, with the renewal of the air force strategy no i think they're all good points and you know given that the 2016 white paper was based you know a lot of the work was done in 2014 2015 and i do remember the assumptions about it and i think we've all been surprised at the rate of change mm. in the strategic environment i i suppose Maybe we just tease out some of those key focus areas. Uh, I, I sort of heard in what you said before, you were looking in terms of uh, engagement, international engagement, and that's obviously uh, gone higher in the priority list. Yeah, um, I think I'd, I'd probably, um, if I could just put a bit more context mm. around, I think, Jeff, too, though. Um, and then I, and I would like to then talk through, you know, the key structure, I guess, of the okay. Air Force strategy itself, sure. which is... You know, gets to our lines of effort. And I emphasise that the Air Force strategy is just the way that I'm using to explain what it is that we want to be able to do. How do we want to get better at what we do to deliver Air Force business, deliver air power for a joint force in a better way that everyone can understand? Uh, so, you know, in some ways it's no different to what we've done in the past. It's just another way of, and I think, you know, trying to make it a more understandable way. But most importantly, um, First Principles Review delivered us that so-called um, the concept around the strategic centre. So where do we fit within that? What's the language that's being used in there? How do we align our strategy to have language that's consistent, have a narrative that's consistent with the overall strategy across the Department of Defence? The the Chief of Defence Force is now working on better describing the defence mission and how that cascades down through to eventually get to what's the Air Force mission. Uh, So my aim is to make sure that everyone in the Air Force understands what our Air Force mission is. How does that fit within the ADF mission? And indeed, how does that fit within the defence mission? And that's where, that's the articulation of the Air Force strategy with that new language, with the new terminology, with the intent um, that is being now put forward through a strategic review across defence, still consistent with the white paper, and indeed, but keeping pace with policy updates and policy settings as as they emerge to keep pace with the strategic environment. And that's, uh, and that's where the, the key bits of the strategy really start to come into play um, for us to be able to um, articulate that um, as a narrative for everyone in Air Force to understand, but also those that we work with around Air Force to also understand where it is we want to go. To be able to you know, come back to us and say, hey, we're not quite sure that we agree. Here's some other ways you might think about it. Uh, and make sure we can test and adjust. And, and as much as anything, it's about that roadmap to our future to make sure that we remain relevant. We have a value proposition that's of use to the government um, and that we can deliver on that in an agile way. Okay, no, no, that's, uh, that's great. It, it's, it's probably been interesting. We might just delve into, uh, you know, COVID-19, the bushfires. Uh, Defence has been used uh, fairly significantly mm-hmm. by, by government. Um, do you see any great changes out of that experience or, or do you see um, that you, you were just able to put forward capabilities that were relevant across the spectrum? Um, 
Yes, yeah, certainly there are changes. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's probably a, a key question that the, the government has made it very clear what their strategic direction is for Air Force and the policy settings around that. That hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. um, what we're expected to do as a Defence Force to support uh, the full spectrum, what I'd call the spectrum of conflict, and that includes from um, peace and domestic support, in this case uh, disaster relief, uh, all the way up through to high-end war fighting. So um, uh, that hasn't changed. Uh, so the government, uh, when they look at what they expect defence to do, well, you can see that we were asked to do a lot, and indeed we needed to do a lot around the bushfires and the assistance there. And indeed we've been asked to do a lot around the support to COVID-19. Uh, so I think at the peak of the first wave of COVID-19, we had uh, around 2,500 defence personnel uh, contributing to, but supporting law enforcement agencies mm -hmm. and authorities, but supporting state authorities um, when, when requested and directed by the federal government to support the states. Uh, so that's a, they're, they're sort of areas that we as, an, as a defence force um, have reviewed in terms of making our responses better, uh, more appropriate to support the government and the, the people of Australia when it's required. But in terms of um, structure of the ADF, uh, that's, you know, there's been plenty of debate and commentary about that. Uh, the old phrase, I guess, of uh, how we would talk about defence, um, and in this case, Air Force, being structured for war and adapted for peace, that's kind of the old way we would have described it. Um, it's probably more than that now. So uh, what we are trying to do is we have to get a a good understanding of what structure we need within our Air Force to be able to deliver the capabilities that are needed across the full spectrum of conflict. So that is a subtle change. Um, what does that mean? How do we gather all those tasks and the requirements that we'll have? And how do we then prioritise those against a constrained budget to deliver on our investment requirements so that we can manage risk in our future force, or sorry, manage risk in our current force, our force in being, while we, while we develop that force through to what we might need in the future. So that roadmap, crystal balling, looking at what our future requirements might be while we still ensure that we can deliver today. That's really where I'm trying to get this balance out of our, our, our movements forward. Uh, I don't think that's any different to when you were the Chief of Air Force. Um, it's something that we continually have to continue to address and look at to ensure that we are as efficient as possible um, but as effective as we can be to deliver across that full spectrum of requirements. Uh, and that's, uh, that's probably one of the things that's changed the most uh, in, in, and as we expect will start to change as we move forward, uh, that we may have less warning, warning time than we've anticipated in the past as well. And certainly bushfires, COVID-19, uh, you know, COVID-19 in particular, not much warning time for it. And if you view COVID-19 as a really a good example of what a contested and congested environment might be like and how do we operate in that sort of environment? Well, the current world is, is uh, forcing us to have to operate and, and think about how we operate in that sort of an environment. So in some ways, that's a trend and a, an example of where we need to be going in the future and being able to respond agile uh, in an agile way and, and, uh, and very rapidly. Yeah, no, no, thanks. And I, I think that's a good summation because it, it has changed. Um, the demands at both ends of the spectrum, I'd say, are greater now than certainly they were three or four years ago. Well, Mel, look, on behalf of the Williams Foundation, I'd really like to thank you for taking the time to, uh, you know, walk us through the Air Force strategy in a pretty wide-ranging discussion. Mm. And I certainly look forward to when we can get back together in a more normal environment. So thank you. Thanks very much, Jim.